Hi everyone, this is Andy and in today's lecture we're going to continue to talk about the cell and more specifically we will discuss the transport across the membrane. Now the one function of plasma membranes that we're going to talk about in great detail is going to be the transport because that is what hi that is what's highlighted on the IMAT specifications on that biology section. And the first part that we're going to discuss in terms of transport is the passive membrane transport. There's an active membrane transport and there's a passive membrane transport and that is the first one we're going to take a look at. And why it is called passive membrane transport is because it requires no energy. You don't need ATP in order to conduct the transport across the membrane. Passive transport is defined as the movement of substance across a membrane without the need to expand chemical energy like ATP as I just mentioned. And what drives this uh, passive transport is the notion of diffusion. And what diffusion really means is that it's the net movement of a substance from a region of higher concentration to the region of lower concentration. And I'm going to explain that in detail. So what we have here is plenty of these white little molecules and it could be anything. It could be a solute, it could be water. And this is our plasma membrane. It is semi-permeable. As you can see, there are holes going past it. However, it does not allow every single molecule to go through it. Now what diffusion really means is that there is a higher concentration on this side and there's a lower concentration over here. And what's going to happen because of these concentration differences is that the higher concentration will migrate towards the lower concentration. And that is called concentration gradient because it is driven by the notion of concentration gra gradient as there is a higher concentration on one side and a lower on the other side. Now they're going to migrate between each other. There's going to be migration on this side as well from lower to higher, but not as much as from higher to lower. And what happens is they form an equilibrium where both sides become equal. That is the whole point of diffusion and it is a spontaneous process. It happens without any energy input. Now I also wanted to discuss the the process of osmosis and osmosis is basically the passive diffusion of water so we're concentrating on H2O here on water and this is an illustration that I made here just to depict the different uh, stances that osmosis would occur in so what we have is a sack of water this could be a permeable a membrane that uh, would allow water to pass through uh, and basically what this is is a two molar solution of, uh, of sucrose of sugar right so it has it is mainly composed of water but it does have some sugar in it and the concentration of that sugar would be two molar solution and what we have in this tank right here is that it's filled with water and the concentration of the solute, which would be the sucrose, is zero. So it's just straight water. That's all it is. And now on this one, there's a concentration of 10 moles. And on the last one is 2 moles. So let's, like, let's take a look at the first scenario with 2 moles of sucrose in a water bag. And it's, that bag is going to be dropped into just straight water. It's just distilled water with zero concentration of the solute. Now if the solution that is surrounding a cell, which would be this zero concentration solution, and if this solution surrounding a cell contains dissolved substances at lower concentration than the cell, which it does because it has zero compared to two, it's lower concentration, the solution is said to be hypotonic to the cell. So it would be hypotonic. And if uh, when, the, when a cell is in hypotonic solution, as it is here, water enters by osmosis. So water from the outside would enter inside because the concentration uh, 
of water outside is going to be higher than the concentration of water inside because this has some sucrose in it, this has nothing in it. So the concentration of water compared to the sucrose will be higher on the outside and lower on the inside. So water is going to flow inside and therefore as you can see the bag, the sack of water is going to expand a little bit. And that's going to be called a hypotonic solution and the cell, this water bag is going to swell. Now looking at the opposite scenario where 2 molar is dropped into a higher concentration of solute of 10 molar. Now what happens here is that if the solution that is surrounds um, the a cell contains solutes at higher concentrations, which it does, then the outside solution is said to be hypertonic. So this is exactly the opposite, is hypertonic solution because it has a higher concentration of solute than the, the cell right here. And what happens when a cell is in hypertonic solution is that water leaves by osmosis. Water leaks out of this cell into the solution because the solution contains a lower concentration of water compared to inside the cell because of its uh, concentration gradient that would go from higher inside the cell to lower outside the cell and water is going to flow out of the little sac into the hypertonic solution and this will cause the cell and the bag to shrink. And the last third scenario that occurs within osmosis is that the two moles of, uh, of the solute and, and the sac will be dropped into the same concentration and what happens is there's an equilibrium because both concentrations of water and the solute are equal in the outside environment and the inside environment which will cause an isotonic solution isotonic and the cell will neither shrink or expand all right so now let's switch to the passive membrane transport and how it actually occurs so there's two ways for passive membrane transport first is simple membrane uh, passive membrane transport and there's facilitated so first we're going to talk about simple passive membrane transport. Now simple meaning that there are no proteins that are needed in order to transport anything through. This all occurs by molecules approaching the phospholipid bilayer and simply seeping their way through to the other side because of the concentration gradient. So if there's a higher amount of something on the outside and a lower amount on the inside, the membrane is going to let them through. However, it does not let everything through, of course. It filters out molecules and it is uh, completely based on size and charge of the molecule. So first, if we're looking at molecules like oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide or nitrogen, these molecules would simply go right through to the other side. Now why is that? Because they're small and because they're non-polar. They're non-polar. Meaning that they, they have no charges and they're small molecules so they will, they will very likely go right through the membrane as long as the concentration gradient allows it to. Next we have structures like uh, water for example and these would be small uncharged but they are polar molecules and they would also go through but at a lower a lower rate than nonpolar so this would be polar molecules so structures like water or glycerol they're small uncharged polar molecules that would also go directly through based on the concentration gradient however not as much as the oxygen or the carbon dioxide that's nonpolar now next we have something like uh, glucose, which would be quite a large molecule of glucose compared to the phospholipid bilayer. And typically glucose would not make its way through on a simple concentration gradient, only because glucose is very large. It is uncharged, it is polar, 
but it is a large molecule so it's it's not typically going to make its way through the phospholipid bilayer despite the concentration gradient being in its favor and the final thing would be ions so chloride ion the potassium ion and uh, sodium ion so all these ions are very crucial for the cell you cannot have a cell that just simply seeps through ions on a concentration gradient because it does uh, create big problems for the cell that we're going to discuss later in the course however these molecules they are ions so they're charged they're polar they are ions although they are they could be small because they're just a chlorine atom it, it, they are ions they're charged and they do not make their way through in a simple passive membrane transport so in general permeability would increase in this direction next facilitated diffusion is carried out by two types of transport proteins so it does need to transport protein that's why it's called facilitated however it still does not require any energy because it is passive membrane transport and there's two types of proteins that do this which would be channel proteins or carrier proteins and we're going to discuss both now the purpose of channel proteins is that they form these hydrophilic pathways through the phospholipid bilayer for molecules to simply pass through on a concentration gradient so what we have here this first one is an aquaporin it is the channel protein that allows water to simply pass through on a on a uh, concentration gradient so there's a higher concentration on the outside of the cell lower concentration on the inside of the cell and it allows it basically creates this little tunnel for them to pass because typically water is not very good it, it can slide through the phospholipid bilayer but it's not very good at doing that and especially when the cell is dehydrated it needs a, a lot more water inside is going to have these aquaporins that will open up these tunnels so to speak they're hydrophilic water loving tunnels that will allow water to come in and simply slide through inside the cell because of the concentration gradient now the other type of channel protein would be the calcium voltage gated channel now that's just an example there's plenty of voltage gated channels in the cells however just as as an example basically we would have the calcium going from the area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration in this direction and calcium would be flowing out of the cell and it is facilitated by these channel proteins but they're voltage gated channels and what this means is there there must be some sort of uh, voltage change across the membrane and the activation of the gate of the potassium channels opens and potassium moves moves through so if there's no stimulus if there's no electrical stimulus to the to, to the membrane these channels would not open and it's not just simply going to allow potassium to get outside the cell if it is not needed all right let's move on to the carrier protein and the difference between the uh, channel protein is that carrier protein has two different conformations it has the open conformation and the closed conformation so here we have the open conformation the higher concentrations on the outside of the cell and the lower concentrations on the inside of the cell now this region that i'm pointing to that's going to be the binding site bind site and that's basically the site where this yellow molecule would enter and it would bind to this region like that and it would cause a conformational change to uh, the the carrier protein and it would make it flip to the other side which would basically allow this yellow molecule to come out on the other side at the lower concentration now once the the solute is uh, is able to go to the other side it again flips and switches 
to this normal conformation as it was at the beginning and it would bind another one and it would switch flip over and so on so this would be a reoccurrence as long as the concentration gradient allows it to because if the concentration gradient is not higher on the outside and lower on the inside it will not occur in this manner it would not transform it in this way because the conformation would simply would not switch now the other type of membrane transport is going to be the active membrane transport and it is defined as molecules moving across the membrane against the concentration gradient and movement against the concentration gradient requires ATP it requires energy in order to do that and it requires quite a significant amount of energy and uh, it, I find it really fascinating because the energy that is usually in the form of ATP it is estimated that about 25% of cells ATP requirements are for the active transport of molecules. That is insane. That is quite a lot. I mean, 25% of your energy is simply going towards these little things being transported inside and outside the cell. That's incredible. All right, now back to the topic at hand. The active memory transport is basically in terms happens in terms of primary and secondary membrane transport we're going to talk about both and first of all we're going to discuss the primary membrane transport so in primary active membrane transport the same protein that transports molecules it also hydrolyzes ATP on the same site basically this the same protein does everything uh, to carry these molecules in and out of the cells and that's why it is called primary because in secondary it is facilitated this ATP hydrolysis is facilitated and the energy is provided in a different mechanism that we'll talk about so what we have in this example is the sodium potassium pump and this occurs in every plasma membrane of every cell and what this has it's basically a ratio between three to two so three sodium ions are being pumped out of the cell and two potassium ions are being taken into the cell as you can see here and this exchange is called the sodium potassium pump now since this works against the concentration gradient we must note that the concentration of sodium would be quite low on inside the cell in the cytosol and it would be much higher on the outside the cell however what this uh, pro the, what this protein pump does is it makes it go against the concentration gradient to really flush out these sodium ions now what we have is there are two binding sites there's two sides to the binding the one side would be low affinity meaning it's basically disabled as you can see the triangle here and the round ones for the sodium would be high affinity they're ready to bind the sodium and it's going to facilitate the sodium binding in order to transform it out of the cell so once it binds the the molecule switches and it and the switch switching would require energy the molecule the pump cannot have its conformation change without a, the use of ATP so it would attach this phosphate ion and the breakdown is of the phospho and hydride bond causes a big release of energy which allows this protein pump to switch its conformation and release the sodium ions to the other side of, of the cell now once this occurs then of course the binding sites for the sodium become low affinity meaning that the sodium simply uh, dissociates from them because they're in low affinity and because of the conformational change and once the sodium side has low affinity the potassium side has a higher affinity for uh, its substrates and potassium that is in high concentration uh, inside the cell label this as high concentration in low concentration outside the cell it would still make the potassium bind to this binding site because of the high affinity and once it binds of course you would have the uh, the phosphate dissociate and the dissociation of phosphate would make 
the pump switches confirmation back to the original site and of course the affinities for each side would change to being exactly the same as they were at the start the potassium is released because of the low affinity on that side and because of the higher affinity the cycle begins again with sodium binding to it now the other type of active membrane transport is called the secondary active membrane transport and Secondary occurs by two mechanisms known as symport and antiport. So we've got symport on this side. I'm going to label that here, symport and antiport. So first of all, let's label these molecules based on their concentration. So this blue one is going to have low concentration here low concentration the red one will have a higher concentration and of course the red one on this side will have a lower concentration and the blue one here will have higher concentration in symport the co-transported solute moves through the membrane channel in the same direction as you can see the red and the blue move in the same direction as the driving ion, a phenomenon known as co-transport. So we're going to label this as co-transport. Now what basically happens in co-transport is that this, the molecule that is red, because it's going from high concentration to low concentration, it is the co-transport because it makes the uh, symport, the secondary membrane transport system that is symport, to allow the molecule from lower concentration gradient to go to higher concentration gradient against its concentration gradient because of this force that is going from higher to lower concentration gradient. That is the driving ion force allowing both molecules to come in at the same time one going against its concentration gradient and one going along its concentration gradient. Now looking at the antiport, we're going to label these structures again. So the red would have a high concentration here. The blue would also have a high concentration on this side. And both of the molecules uh, inside the cell would have a lower concentration. Now in antiport, the driving ion moves through the membrane channel in one direction so the driving ion would be the one going from the higher to lower it would be going in one direction but providing the energy for the active transport of another molecule in the opposite direction that would be the, the blue molecule so basically this movement of going from higher concentration to lower concentration provides the energy the ATP if you will for the molecule to go from low concentration to high concentration against its concentration gradient and that is called secondary active memory transport because it does not in the, the hydrolyze ATP in a direct manner such as the primary active memory transport. And this type of opposite direction uh, transport would be called exchange, exchange diffusion. Diffusion. And in many cases, uh, antiport is typically used by ions and symport is typically used by molecules such as glucose and amino acids. Now the final phenomenon that we're going to discuss that is based on plasma membranes is going to be exocytosis and endocytosis. And this is basically how molecules, different uh, vesicles, are able to go outside the cell and inside the cell. First, let's take a look at exocytosis, meaning that uh, molecules going outside the cell. How would they leave the cell? And first, what we have here is uh, we have a vesicle. This would be called a vesicle that contains some sort of material, these little dots inside. And that's the plasma membrane. And what happens is the vesicle approaches the plasma membrane and it's, a, it's called a secretory secretory secretion 
vesicle. And its function is to go along to the plasma membrane and dump these uh, molecules outside the cell. They could be hydrolyzed molecules that are just waste products or metabolites or whatever else, whatever happens to be in the cell. So what happens is once it approaches the plasma membrane, it's going to fuse with the plasma membrane. As you can see, the phospholipid bilayer of the secretory vesicle and the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane is going to fuse together, forming this open chain that is going to allow the molecules to simply exit the cell. And that's called exocytosis. Now we're going to take a look at the two structures of endocytosis and first one is going to be bulk phase endocytosis which could also be called pinocytosis and the essence of bulk phase endocytosis is that the vesicle imports water and other substances from outside the cell. So what we have here is just a plasma membrane that has there's plenty of molecules here that could be water could be other molecules that exist just floating around outside the cell. Now, if the requirements for the cell uh, is to get some water because it is uh, dehydrated, for example, what we would have is the uh, is endocytosis, bulk phase endocytosis, because the membrane uh, pockets inward, enclosing the solute molecules and water molecules, and ultimately, what occurs is that it forms this pocket and it creates its own vesicle. Now this vesicle is not a secretory vesicle because this vesicle just introduced new molecules inside the cell that are going to be used for various reasons. And because it's not a secretory vesicle and it's not going to be excreted, this one would be called the endocytic. endocytic vesicle. And the final type, the, the second type of endocytosis is called a receptor mediated endocytosis. And what we have here is that this endocytosis will be based on receptors and the target molecules. So the receptors are going to be th these little structures that are on the outside of the plasma membrane. Now these little dots uh, that we're going to label here, these little uh, red structures. These ones are called clathrin. Cla clathrin. And basically what these clathrin molecules do is they reinforce the formation of this pocket. They allow this pocket to occur as long as there is binding of these receptor molecules of these uh, target proteins, let's just say, that would bind to the receptors. And wherever the binding occurs, you see the yellow structure bonded here with the receptor. Wherever that binding occurs, the clathrin is going to facilitate the formation of an endocytic vesicle. It's going to facilitate this formation right here. And ultimately what happens is the, the membrane pinches off a, an endocytic vesicle uh, with clathrin attached to the outside of it and the receptor bonded to the molecules that is needed for inside the vesicle. And this is called receptor mediated endocytosis. This brings us to the end of the topic for today. And in the next class, we're going to talk about cellular structures and their specific functions.